Bible Church. Great to have everybody that we seem to know as you look around. And then there's a few that might be new or newer. And we're glad you're here. Uh, my name is Dave Hobbs. I'm one of the associate pastors with Jim Woodchuck, our senior, and Chad Owens, who is away with the youth on a winter camp trip. Getting back this afternoon, having a great time. And great teaching from a real servant of the Lord there, Adam Dixon. And as you pray for them, keep praying. They've got a few, a couple of hours left uh, where they may be still digesting what they've been given over the camp. But then that's trip home that we trust will be safe. And um, so again, a welcome to y'all. That you should see. Did I say y'all? I did, didn't I? I hope you'll forgive me on that. Um, Josh, thankfully the mic was turned somewhat down when I said. Y'all, but anyway. Inside your bulletin is the grace, what we call the Grace Connection. And this is a, a part, one side is for welcome, the other part is for response to different things that uh, are opportunities for ministry and fellowship and so on. And you can indicate your interest there. When there are meetings that use the word interest, it doesn't mean that if you go to the meeting, you're going to be signed up to do thus and such. and don't have a voice, it does mean come if you're interested and learn about it and see if God has a place for you in that particular uh, area that's being talked about. So let me remind you of a number of things. If you take your bullet and look inside, let me remind you of a number of uh, op opportunities. We have a sing-along tonight at 6.30 in the Dome. Those of you who've been to that, it's a great opportunity to just let your spirit soar with those wonderful songs at 6.30, uh, led by John Hosteller. John, are you here? No, nope, not yet, but he will be maybe. Anyway, then on the next page, you see a number of things. Uh, the grief share ministry that did start, but you can come. You can come and pray. You can be at home and pray. You can come and participate. Um, talk to Lynn if there's another way that you'd want to be helpful to her in this. But uh, that's Thursday evening. You see the details there. The Wednesday, uh, sorry, the women's Bible studies, morning and evening, has started. Not too late, though, for you to participate, and they'd love it if you could. There's the information there, the Tuesday evening and the Thursday morning. If you have questions about it, you can talk to me, and I'll channel you to the right person if you're not sure who it is to talk to about that. Uh, Ladies of Grace, Grace has their life share again this coming Saturday. Uh, Marilyn Vincent sharing. And uh, that's 8.30 to 9.30 in the annex. That's what we call our building, back building behind this main building here. The, the, uh, and again, we're just highlighting some things. There's a note there about the men. But at the bottom there, the Grace Kids Wednesday nights is a great opportunity every summer. And if you're interested in that, we'd love for you to come to this meeting and listen to ideas we have for the summer and talk about maybe something that's on your heart this summer. And um, if you're 16 and up, uh, you're welcome to come to that meeting and be a part of seeing what God wants us to do this summer on Wednesday nights with our, with our young people. Um, family and friends dinner is Wednesday night. Somebody just asked me, what's the menu? And the menu is TBD. Who knows what that is? Yes. To be decided. To be decided. That works. Right. So it's... Uh, that's not the same thing as mystery meat. That's not the same thing. <laughs> Somebody can remember that yet. Anyway, it'll be, it'll be wonderful. But the best opportunity besides the hospitality, which is warm, and the friendships, uh, and, the, and the food, rather, is the friendships and the fellowship you can have as we try to mix and mingle with each other and get to know people better and have the young people draw from some of the wisdom of the olds and some of the older people get a little more young hearted and <coughs> hanging around the young, you know, all that stuff, so. And the jam choir meets that unique time there at 540 after the children have eaten. They're um, preparing with Joyce to sing. I think they've got a special coming up next Sunday. Yes, there's the nod of Joy's head, and that's going to be super. So, But if your child hasn't been yet, it's not too late. We'd love to have them. Love to have them. And then there's information also there about the parking lot uh, situation, the project going on there. And then the missionaries of the week this week is Dan and Ann King. How many of you are on Facebook and you're a part of their prayer page? Anybody? Okay. If you're on Facebook, just do a search for Dan and Ann King. And they've got, um, I think it's called Prayers for the Kings in Cologne. That Facebook page. that they, They're on regularly there and keep, keep us updated on things we can pray for. 
All right. Um, let's open our time of worship. In a sense, we already have, because these things are all about what God wants to be doing among us and uh, ministry that's his. But let's read scripture to open our focus of worship on him now. You see in the uh, inside the bulletin there, just inside the front cover, John 14, 16 through 18. All right. Let's uh, let's stand, please. Let's just read this together. Let's stand and read this together, please. All right. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's lift our voices. Let's sing and remind each other and ourselves of the hope that we have in Jesus. And let's sing this together. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong?
Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What patience, what patience would wait as we constantly roam. What father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. for 
join me in a time of prayer. We're going to lift up uh, the various ministries in our church, and uh, Pastor Dave has already mentioned the Greek Share ministry coming up this Thursday, but uh, there are other ministries. We uh, have men who gather on Tuesday mornings, Thursday mornings, Thursday night, uh, different times, as well as our Wednesday night gathering, but let's pray uh, for those ministries. Let's continue to pray for our youth who are uh, on a retreat right now. Uh, up there uh, in the Doe River Gorge. And uh, what did you say, Dave? Go Doe. That's what the, the, their motto was. Go Doe this weekend. A beautiful place and so thankful for Adam Dixon, uh, as Pastor Dave mentioned, is sharing with them. Uh, Adam and his wife, Jen, serve at University of Tennessee with crew. But let's pray for them and their safe return. Um, various ones who are going through a time of loss. Uh, we'll keep on praying for Joyce and such a joyful uh, time of remembering and hearing from his family about uh, the legacy of Larry Stacker. Uh, let's keep on praying for uh, Deborah Bush and the homegoing, her mom, and others as well. If you'll join me as we pray. 
Father, thank you so much for uh, what Zeb and the worship team have reminded us uh, this morning about yet not I, uh, but the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, you live your life through us as we abide in you. Father, thank you for the way our church has uh, borne one another's burdens this last week. And Lord, keep on encouraging Jody Weesey and her family. And uh, Lord, encourage your sister and her brothers. And uh, Father, we thank you so much for uh, Mrs. Rouse's life and blessing she has been to us. Lord, pray for Deborah and her family and uh, Kaylee and the loss of uh, Deborah's mom. And to thank you that she is with you and so not lost. We continue to pray for Joyce, and thank you so much, Lord, for uh, Larry Stacker's life and uh, the glory to Christ that was in his service. We pray for uh, Lynn Fry and the Grief Share Ministry this Thursday. We lift up to you the men's and women's Bible studies that will take place, as well as Awana. And thank you so much, Lord, for uh, those who faithfully uh, teach our children. Lord, thank you for our Sunday school teachers, Lord, for uh, Sharon and uh, Jared and Rachel, for Matthew, and uh, so many others who week after week uh, plant the seed of your word. Can you continue to strengthen them as they do that? We pray for the camps that are getting ready, uh, Camp uh, uh, Cumberland Springs Bible Camp and Camp Ozone and uh, Camp Tuckalichi and various places where uh, we support missionaries. We pray uh, that you'd strengthen them and encourage them. Lord, we uh, Lord, pray especially that uh, you would uh, provide uh, for those who are going to be counselors and raise up the workers who are uh, needed. Father, thank you for Danny and Ann King and the creative ways uh, that they serve you in Germany among uh, refugees uh, from Syria and Afghanistan and other places, as well as uh, just the, uh, those who've suffered from the flooding in Germany. Thank you for providing a place uh, for the kings to live and minister. And Father, I pray that you fill them with your spirit and provide uh, all that they need in their service to you there. And Lord, uh, give them boldness, fill them with your spirit to be your witnesses and encourage their children as well. Father, you know uh, those uh, needs that we have individually, but we also pray for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters who feel threatened with 190,000 troops on their borders. Uh, Father, we pray that they would seek your face and know your comfort and know your peace. Those pastors, those camps on the Black Sea and other places. Father, I ask that our uh, president, our leaders, our secretary of state would, uh, Lord, in this time of crisis, humble themselves and seek your face that we as a nation turn away from our wicked ways and help those in our armed forces who are being deployed, encourage and strengthen them. We thank you for so many who serve in public places who have been under a lot of stress uh, during these pandemic days continue to strengthen them. And Father, we do uh, pray that you'd be glorified in the uh, last activities of our winter camp youth retreat and bless uh, Chad and all his helpers and Adam and uh, Chandler as he leads in worship. Thank you so much uh, for them. Father, help us in our marriages. And uh, Father, I pray that you would uh, be glorified in the marriages, the new marriages uh, that are coming, and especially pray for uh, Silas and Becca, and thank you so much for them. Pray that you'd be glorified in that wedding as well as the others uh, that are soon to come. And now, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things out of your law, that we'd be doers of the word and not hearers only. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. This time, those who are heading to Grace Kids Church are dismissed. Thank you, Joy and Emma. In one of the 
more famous passages in Jesus' teaching, Jesus says to Nicodemus, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Um, don't miss those two verbs. Unless you're born again, you can't see it. Unless you're born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter it. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. In order to see the kingdom of God, there is a miracle that has to take place to enable you to see that which was previously invisible. You may remember from your history classes, your Western Civ classes, that uh, in the Middle Ages, it was thought that um, life, like insect life, came about spontaneously. And it was called the theory of spontaneous generation. And it was thought that uh, if you left meat out, that maggots would spontaneously uh, grow in that meat. They would just kind of show up uh, spontaneously. And uh, this was thought to be the explanation of how those maggots got in the meat. But then scientists like Spallanzini and Pasteur and Lister and others began to turn their new technology, the microscope uh, and other tools, onto a previously unseen world. And they realized that if you put meat in a sealed container, lo and behold, no maggots. Some of you should try this at home. Uh, that there actually is much more than what we can see with our unaided vision. And that if you have the proper eyes to see, there's a whole world there on the microscopic level. We have just spent billions to send a telescope to a point uh, equidistant between the sun and the earth, or approximately equidistant, to enable us to see further into space, and it's unfolding its uh, big reflector the size of a tennis court uh, so to allow that telescope to operate, to see what was previously unseen. In this morning's passage in the book of Mark, the questions that Jesus asks us uh, and that we would ask of Jesus invite us to see that invisible world. Maybe you remember the story about how Elisha was pursued by the army of Syria to the city of Dothan. And as he was surrounded by that army, his servant got nervous. And in 2 Kings 6, 17, Elisha prays for his servant and says, Lord, open his eyes. And when his eyes are open, he sees that there's an army much bigger than the Syrian army around that city of Dothan. Dothan. Well, Jesus talks about this invisible world that before one is born again cannot be seen. And Jesus has said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. You have to be born of water and the spirit, born of the spirit to see that kingdom. We talked last week about how the gospel of Mark is full of interrogation. It's full of questions that people ask Jesus, or about Jesus, where'd you get these things? Or what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Or uh, and all these questions that uh, Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? And in particular, this question is answered by a passage this morning. The high priest asked Jesus and saying to him, are you the Christ?
Christ, the Son of the Blessed. And Jesus, in the climactic confrontation with the disciples, asks his disciples, Who do you say that I am? So if you would, turn with me to Mark chapter 1, and we'll back up one verse, pick it up in verse 8, and go uh, eight verses this morning. Mark chapter 1, verses 8 through 15. Mark chapter 1, verses 8 through 15. I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered to him. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, we've mentioned already that uh, this gospel of Mark is a gospel written probably in Rome by John, whose surname is Mark. That's his Roman Empire name, Marcus. He's writing in Rome to Romans. And Rome, as you probably uh, remember, is a seat of political power. But this gospel is full of news of another kingdom. If you remember your Old Testament history, you remember that the book of Daniel has a lot to say and we're going to get to more of Daniel chapter 7 later. But this morning, just consider this verse from Daniel 2.44 and the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had and Daniel's interpretation of that vision. He says, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Uh, you know, it's, it's great to be uh, patriotic and, and to be a good citizen of the earthly kingdom that you live in. But don't forget that this kingdom, this American empire, is temporary. Uh, it's not here to stay. We pray that it's long lived. But there's only one kingdom which will not be destroyed. Uh, a dear friend of mine who uh, uh, helped our family care uh, for Susan's brother a little bit, is uh, from a, a country in Asia, and he has worked so hard to enter America, to enter America legally, and uh, did everything he possibly could, and it broke his heart a few years ago when he was deported uh, by our government back to his homeland. He had done everything to try to navigate this kingdom. Well, Jesus wants us to have our eyes open, to see this kingdom that Daniel talked about, this kingdom which will never be destroyed. And this kingdom uh, was the subject of a lot of debate. And people talked about, well, where is it? Where is it going to show up? And in Luke chapter 17, Jesus issues this correction. When he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come by observation. Nor will they say, see here and see there, for indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, I'm jumping way over to Luke's gospel to remind us that the kingdom is present already in the person of the king. And when he is ruling inside of us, the kingdom has already arrived, and yet there is a future dimension to that kingdom. It is right to pray, Lord, your kingdom come. But this morning, in this passage, we want to talk about seeing the kingdom. Seeing the kingdom that, for many people, is invisible. In particular, in the baptism of Jesus, his identity as the king is on display. We'll talk about why that was so apparent for those who were there who had eyes to see it. We see the kingdom in the person of the king. We also see the kingdom in the conflict that's mentioned where Jesus is, after the Holy Spirit is uh, coming upon him, the Spirit does something a little bit surprising and drives him into the wilderness for single combat. 
for a spiritual combat. And we see the conflict of our king in his kingdom. And then thirdly, in verses 14 and 15, there is a call to you and to me about how to enter the kingdom. Did you see the Nicodemus conversation? Jesus said, unless you're born again, you can't see it. Unless you're born of water and the spirit, you can't enter it. To see it and to enter it is the goal of the, of the gospel. And the call in verses 14 and 15 tells us how to enter this kingdom and to have our eyes open. Now, uh, let's uh, get into this a little bit more deeply. Look again at Jesus' baptism there uh, in uh, verses 8 and following. Look at verse 8. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so it comes to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Uh, this is about 27 or 28 A.D., what has Jesus been doing in Nazareth for 30 years? We hear him referred to in this gospel as the carpenter. He's been in Nazareth, and those years are silent, and lots of people have been really tempted to try and fill in the blanks about what Jesus was saying and doing, but he's been silent. And yet now, the time is full. And he comes from Nazareth, where he's grown up, and he comes to where John is baptizing at the Jordan River. He has been uh, there in Nazareth of Galilee, and now he's come down into Judea. And immediately, if you are using the uh, ESV uh, Bible journal uh, that we gave out, and we, we're about to run out of those, we can get more if you want them. But you see that word immediately there in verse 9, uh, that or verse uh, 10. That is the first occurrence of a word that uh, Peter and Mark can't stop saying, and that is immediately. It's the first of 41 times that Mark tells us that something happened immediately. And, and you're going to see it again in this passage that the action in Mark is rapid fire. And it's happening. And rather than telling us as much of what Jesus said, uh, Peter, through Mark, his writer, show us what Jesus is doing. And the action comes quickly. This is the first time immediately happens. Immediately coming up from the water. Uh, look at that word there, and I'm using New King James. If you're uh, using ESV, I think it's very similar. Jesus comes up, and the Spirit comes down. There is this revelation of Jesus as the King. Now, uh, we read in John's Gospel that John the Baptist had been given a cue for how he would recognize the person who had the ability to give the Holy Spirit. Look with me over at the John chapter 1, verse 32. If you have your Bibles there, uh, paper or digital, turn over to John chapter 1. We'll see if the paper turners are faster than the button clickers. John chapter 1, verse 32. John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John the Baptist has been given this cue that when you see the Spirit coming down in a dove-like form, and that's a little bit of an image from creation where the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters. You see the Spirit coming something like a dove. We're not sure exactly what it appeared like. That's the one who's going to give the Holy Spirit, who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. As you may remember in the Old Testament, it was only a few people who obviously had the Spirit. And Moses says, I wish that all of God's people had the Spirit. Well, Jesus is the one who brings that about. Not only that, but in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, uh, this was the prophecy about Messiah. My servant, whom, when, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Now, uh, we have Sunday school for many reasons, uh, but one of the reasons we have Sunday school is so that you will uh, learn these vocabulary words like Messiah. And you may know that Messiah is the Hebrew word for the Greek word Christ, and both Messiah and Christ mean the same thing. Is Christ Jesus' last name? No. no, okay. It's his title. It's not Jesus' first name, last name, Christ. It's Jesus, meaning Yahweh will save. Christ, or Messiah, means 
the anointed one. Anointed with what? Anointed with the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus is baptized, it is the signature of his Christhood. Uh, that's not a word, but it is now. The Spirit is the proof positive that he is the anointed one. What happened when Samuel anointed David in 1 Samuel 16? We read that the Spirit came on him from that day forward. And there's probably something significant that even in the wickedness of his life, God didn't take his mercy. And David is saying, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Don't take the Spirit. But for Samuel says the Spirit was on him from that day forward. So David is a picture ahead of time of what Jesus would be the fulfillment of. And Isaiah says that the Messiah has the Spirit. The Spirit is his anointing. The Spirit proves that he's the Christ, the Messiah. And as we read in John 1, the one on whom the Spirit comes and remains, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, just a reminder, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was still years ahead from the time when John the Baptist was baptizing. And by the way, we read it right after this, that Jesus and his disciples baptize even more people than John the Baptist did. Why do I bring that up? Because water baptism is a picture of the real thing. All right? And don't mix the two. Uh, John 3 can talk about being born of water and the Spirit, but pretty soon in the chapter, it just talks about being born of the Spirit. The water baptism that John the Baptist did and that even Jesus and his disciples did was ahead of the actual coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, remember these talks that we have in the book of Acts when Peter, uh, whose voice we have in the Gospel of Mark, is explaining how he knew Cornelius and his family were Christians. He says this, I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized you with water, but I'll baptize you, I'll cover you with the Holy Spirit. And so when Cornelius, uh, this Roman soldier, and his family are obviously clothed with the Holy Spirit. Peter remembers that is the real thing. Uh, water baptism, of course, we want to water baptize somebody who's believed on the Lord Jesus Christ because the Spirit has already baptized that person. Okay? Paul similarly says, Paul said, John indeed baptized with water saying to the people that should, they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Paul explaining the same thing. Now, uh, there's something a little bit surprising here, and uh, let me ask you a question. When people were being baptized by John the Baptist, what was coming out of their mouths? What were they confessing? Anybody remember from last week? You better answer or I'll have to preach that sermon again. Well, well they were confessing their sins. Thank you. Um, wasn't going to be a double-length sermon, but I was going to have to give it again. Uh, they were confessing their sins. So what is a little bit surprising then about Jesus being baptized? Jesus doesn't have any sin. Or does he? We read in 2 Corinthians 5 that he made him who knew no sin what? To be sin for us. We read in Isaiah 53, 700 years before Jesus was born, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity who? of us all. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. All of us have sinned, and the Lord put on Christ all of our sin, and the penalty of sin is death. And so when Jesus is baptized, we can ask the question, why was Jesus baptized? Because baptism pictures the death and resurrection necessary for our entrance into the kingdom. You see the uh, baptistry under construction here. Uh, and um, if it reminds you approximately of a coffin, of something that will hold a body that lies down and rises up, that's on purpose. That's on purpose because baptism not only is a picture of the new creation that the Spirit brings forth, it's a picture of that the penalty for our sin was death, and in Christ, that penalty has been paid. 
And so when we baptize people, uh, we're reminded of that. We're reminded that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And his baptism uh, shows that, that this is how the kingdom is going to be populated. We often quote Colossians 2.12 when we baptize people, that we are buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And so it's something interesting here that in Mark chapter 1, we see in verse 10 that when Jesus comes up from the water, he sees the heavens open. And all of a sudden, the invisible becomes visible. This seeing the heaven open is used again when Stephen is being stoned to death for his faith. He sees the invisible world and Christ at the right hand of God. We see this word again when Peter has the vision of the, uh, of the unclean animals that lets him know it's okay for Jews and Gentiles to worship together. He sees this change, this opening. So Jesus was baptized because as many of us, Romans 6 says, as we're baptized into Christ Jesus, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, look with me again at verse 10, or verse 11, where when Jesus is baptized, a voice comes from heaven. And the other gospels indicate that it's possible this voice was inaudible to everyone except Jesus, or possibly John the Baptist. In other words, this voice uh, that says these words were told about by the gospel writers, but Jesus hears, he sees the heavens open, and he hears this voice, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The identity of the king is on display, and uh, isn't it a wonderful thing to think that in Christ, the Father is pleased with us. In Christ, Hebrews 10, 14 says, we have been perfected forever by one sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 14 says, by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. In the beloved, Ephesians 1, 6, we are accepted in the beloved and we are complete in him, Colossians 2, 10 says. Perfect, accepted, and complete. And when you come up against your shortcomings in the Christian life, when you come up against those things that you've tried to fix and are still broken, this is a good passage to go back to. And the Father says to the Son, in you I am well pleased, and I am in Christ. Perfect, accepted, and complete. Now, we read in John chapter 7 that the scripture has said, the one who believes in Christ, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So this water baptism pictures the coming of the Spirit, which would not happen until after Jesus had been crucified and resurrected. So the baptism of Jesus shows us the king, and right after that, the sequel is a battle. Look with me there at Mark chapter 1, verse 12. Immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And the language here is, literally, the Spirit cast him into the wilderness. The Spirit takes him from this place where he's revealed as the king into combat. Now, sometimes when you're in a desert place, a dry place, you think, how did I get here? I thought I was obeying. And the answer is, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Sometimes you find yourself in a hard battle and you think, what's going on here? The same conflict that you see in your king. And Luke and Matthew tell us exactly what the temptations were. Mark, in typical fashion, just the facts. He wants to know exactly what happened. And all Mark tells us is that after all these temptations, Luke tells us every temptation Satan departs from him. Uh, how long was he there? Forty days and nights of battle, of spiritual conflict. Now look at the ending of the story of the conflict. He was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. He's being tested. He's being tried. The other gospels tell us what the temptations were. And he was with the wild beasts. Now, 
Uh, look in John, Luke, and Matthew. Uh, you won't find uh, the animals there. You won't find that description. And it's one of those telltale signs that Peter was pretty close to Jesus. And Peter has some details that the other gospels, other gospel writers don't share with us. And so Jesus, after successfully uh, entering this combat, is there with the wild animals. And angels are ministering to him. Can you think of any other place where angels helped out with wild animals? Uh, no, not your backyard. Okay, first of all, there's Daniel. Daniel is put in lion's den for his faith, and he says to the king the next day, Darius, he tells him that God sent his angel who shut the lion's mouth. And in Psalm chapter 90, we read, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and serpent you'll trample underfoot. But I think it's interesting that this mention of wild beasts might have uh, another significance and something that... Um, uh, maybe is a little bit, uh, uh, might be a little bit of a reach, but we read in Daniel chapter 7 that the beasts stand for the Gentile kingdoms that Messiah's kingdom is going to subdue. And then we read there that the angels were ministering to him. Uh, do you know what the job description of an angel is? Hebrews 1.14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits? set out to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So this same ministry that the angels have for Jesus here, they have with you as well. They are ministering spirits, and they are here helping him through this conflict. And we see the king, we see him in his conflict, and we'll spend a little bit of time, lastly, on the call. Look at verse 14. After John was put in prison... Jesus came to Galilee. If you know your geography, Judea is south, Galilee is north, and after John the Baptist is put in prison for uh, saying something that was true about the immorality of the king, uh, Jesus comes back to his home turf, uh, specifically to Capernaum, uh, which is a little ways from Nazareth, but Jesus returns and begins his ministry, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying... The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, here comes the entry into the kingdom. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, uh, in science fiction movies these days, there's something commonly mentioned called a tesseract. And a tesseract, which comes from the Greek word for 40, is a doorway into another world. It's a portal. Uh, it's a place where one world touches another, and different science fiction writers like Madeline Langle and Wrinkle in Time or other science fiction writers talk about it different ways. Just talk about being able to travel from one dimension or one kingdom to another. Well, Jesus is telling you where the true Tesseract is right here. He's saying if you want to travel from the kingdoms you can see and become a person who sees and enters the kingdom which will be and the kingdom which will be and be and be and which will not be destroyed, here it is. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, uh, if you were here for our series of Christmas sermons, it is quite uh, apparent that Jesus came in the exact year and even month and even day that Daniel had prophesied in Daniel chapter 9 that from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem there would be seven sevens and 62 sevens until Messiah the Prince. And if you do the math from the year in which, and the month and the day in which Nehemiah got the, uh, in which uh, the uh, Persian king gave the command to rebuild Jerusalem, Artaxerxes, you can do the math, but be that as it may, Jesus says, the time is right. The time is fulfilled. Galatians 4.4 4 says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, so here's the tesseract. Here's the portal. Here's the place where you go from one kingdom to another. And did you see how it's described? Repent and 
believe. Now, let's talk about these words just a little bit. Um, it's interesting. I, I came across a, a document in my files from the Awana ministry uh, from the 1980s, and it was a scriptural, scriptural evaluation of, let me look at the end of the document here, 16 different ways people sometimes invite people to be saved. And the Awana ministry, uh, to their credit, walk through, walks through these 16 ways and says, these are biblical, these are not. These are the ways in which the Bible invites people to salvation, and these are ways that we've kind of made things up. Well, I think it's wise for us when we're wanting to be precise to use biblical language, repent and believe the gospel. Now, what is repentance? Let's talk about that. Repentance in the Greek is metanoia, which means a change of mind. The doorway, the tesseract, the portal, the way into this kingdom begins with a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. Um, I think we should be careful here to not um, take one Bible scene and make that the norm for everybody because this looks different for different people. Some people uh, uh, want to insist on an emotional sorrow. And, and, you know, churches have sometimes had mourner's benches. Now, I agree that when the Holy Spirit works, then that confession of sin, sorrow for sin will often come. But that's not the word. The word is a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. Robert Leitner, uh, writing in his book, Sin, the Savior, and Salvation, says this, that repentance is necessary for salvation. However, Scripture views repentance as included in believing and not as an additional and separate condition to faith. All who have trusted Christ as Savior have changed their minds regarding Him and their sin. In other words, the repentance that saves, um, and, and I'm, I'm about to get in trouble here, but i just tell you what I think. It's not an ability to cease from every sin in your life. Uh, because who can do that? Who is able to say, well, I'm just going to stop sinning to show that I've repented, and I'm going to conquer every single one of them. No, that's what I need a Savior for. So there is this, I think, mistake of saying that repentance means that oh, all of a sudden I've let go. I remember once uh, meeting a guy who said, well, I want to be saved, but I can't stop smoking. And so once I stop smoking, uh, then I'll be saved. Okay? Uh, well, there's a Savior who wants us to free us from anything that has us in bondage that we should trust. But repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change in direction. Uh, Graham Scroggie says, no one can believe who does not repent. In other words, if you call on Jesus to save you from your sin... You've repented in that you've said, I want to be free of this. That is the repentance that the gospel calls for. Uh, going on in Matthew Poole's commentary, which on the gospels is actually written by a man named John Caligus. He says, to believe the gospel is one thing. To believe in the gospel is another. To believe in the gospel is to place our hope of salvation in the doctrine and promises of the gospel. And the object of that is the king, the person of the mediator. John Murray says it this way. Faith is trust in a person, the person of Christ, the son of God and savior of the lost. It is entrustment of ourselves to him. And so there is this change of mind that leads to a change of direction. And believing the gospel is entrusting ourselves to Christ. Not just the saying, oh, I believe these things happened. It's saying, I'm trusting this Savior to rescue me from my sin, to rest in the gospel. G. Campbell Morgan says this way, believe in the gospel, rest in it, repose in it, let the heart find ease in it, rest in this gospel. 
So we've seen the king revealed in the baptism. We've seen the conflict when he's driven into the wilderness. And then we hear this call. And the question comes to you. Have you entered this kingdom by repenting and believing the gospel? When Paul is summing up his ministry to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he says, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you. What did he proclaim? I taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks. And look at the two things he was teaching. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe the gospel. If you come to this passage, Jesus' question for you is, who do you say that I am? Jesus' baptism reveals him as the king. Jesus' temptation reveals him victorious in conflict. And Jesus' call says, now come, enter this kingdom by turning away from sin and believing in Christ. When Paul is defending himself uh, before the Roman authorities, if you have a red letter Bible and you look at Acts 26, he actually gives us a quote from Jesus' words to him. These letters are in red in your red letter Bible in Acts. This is Jesus speaking in the book of Acts uh, through Paul's testimony. And Jesus had said to Paul, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to do what? To open their eyes. You see, they thought that meat grew maggots just by spontaneous generation and that there was nothing there until they had their eyes opened. We only know a little bit about the solar system and about the universe until a telescope shows us things we couldn't previously see. And our eyes are opened. And Jesus tells Paul, I'm giving you the ministry of opening people's eyes to see things that were previously invisible. This kingdom has a king who gives the Holy Spirit. This kingdom has a king who triumphs over every temptation the enemy can throw at him. And this, this kingdom has a call that the doorway is through a repenting faith. We prayed for the Ukrainians a, a few uh, uh, minutes ago. And uh, Susan's been on a mission trip to the Ukraine and other friends of mine who serve there. You know what they call a true Christian uh, in Ukraine? They call him a repenter. Someone who has changed his mind, leading to a change of direction. And we ask about somebody, is he a believer? The Ukrainians often ask, is he a repenter? The doorway into this kingdom, to seeing and entering, is a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that calls out to him, grabs a hold of him and says, save me from my sins. Repent and believe the good news. As we uh, come to the end of this passage, let me just ask you, uh, do you know the king? Or how is it with you in spiritual warfare? Do you know the king who can help you and give you victory in those battles? And lastly, have you heard his call and responded with turning away from sin and turning to Christ and believing him, believing in the gospel? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for a savior who is mighty to save. Thank you, Father, for a king who... Uh, Lord, shows us the doorway into this kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to have a citizenship that is in heaven. And as good as it is to be a U.S. citizen, thank you for that kingdom which will not be destroyed that's coming. And it already operates in our hearts for those who have received the king. Father, thank you for baptism and its picture of the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus and our death and resurrection with him. Thank you that you put on him the iniquity of us all. And though he had no sin of his own, you put my sin on him. You put our sin on him so that believing in him, we could be forgiven and made right with you now and forever. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand and let's sing. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bids me come to thee. 
of God I come I come just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot O Lamb of God I come I come I come broke can to be mended I come wounded to be healed I come desperate to be rescued I come empty to be filled I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb and I'm welcomed with open God, just as I am. Just as I am, I would be lost, but mercy and grace, my free. to be mended I come wounded to be healed I come desperate to be rescued I come empty to be filled I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb and I'm welcomed with open arms praise God just as I am, I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be Just as I am. And these are important moments at the conclusion of our time to worship where God has given Jim a message for us through the week and then he's delivered it to us this morning. And we don't want to go out just pat Jim, pat each other on the back, say, good job. It's been great to be here and things like that. They have their place when sincere, but the Lord has spoken and he calls. He calls to change your mind about Christ and then to trust him. It leads you to trust him. And it's so important. We're all about to go out and we're going to enjoy each other. And that's right. But if God has spoken to you, don't put it off and don't say, well, I guess he takes care of it all. I don't really do anything except be happy. No. Trust him. Trust the Lord Jesus. And um, if you want someone to help you with words for him, to pray with you about that, Jim Vincent and his wife, Marilyn, will be over to my left. 
but there's Pastor Jim, there's any, lots of believers here, pastors, myself, and so on, but respond to him. We prayed this morning that we would be receptive and responsive. Responsive. If he's spoken to your heart, respond to him. Trust in Christ. He was on the cross in my place and in yours, paying for our sin, and was buried and raised from the dead. We've had that in all the songs this morning, the gospel. Believe the gospel. Father, help anyone and everyone who has heard from you in their soul and heart this morning to not put it off and to not say, well, that felt good or just some, sell it short. But Lord, to turn, to see you differently, repent, to, to think and see you differently as the Son of God, the Savior, and then come to you and trust you. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Jim and Marilyn, where are you? Here they are. There's, yeah. Thank you.